daily patient encounters. Oh, they, but you manage all our parents. Yes. Yeah. Okay. In managing these parents, do you feel that how these parents are supposed to put food on the table and also take care of this child's mental health needs? And they also have their own mental health yeah. problems. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So the list for us as adults has just gotten larger. Isn't it? With less resources to do it. Yeah. Would you say it's a privilege to be able to go to therapy if you get help? Yeah, it's because the wait lists for therapy are extremely long. Mm -hmm. And I've heard before, like, getting a therapist is like dating. Getting a good therapist is like dating, right? Like, you know, you got to go through a few before you find the right one. And a lot of times people don't have patience. First of all, for black people, it's hard enough to even say and, like, agree, like, yes, I'm going to go get therapy. And then when it doesn't work out, yeah. then you're like, oh. So you want me to break up and do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, somebody else is winning. I told you it wouldn't work. Just like, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I forgot the original question. But, yeah. I, mean, I forgot, too. But you, you <laughs> was making all these good points. I'm like, nah, I keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, it is a privilege to get therapy um because also therapy costs right like especially good therapy they have a lot of like free therapies mm -hmm. i know therapists who are prescribing medications and they've never seen the person I recently went to Jackson, Mississippi. How was that? Like, it was like going to Africa. And let okay. me explain. Okay. okay. The way your eyes lit up when you no. said that. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Ghana. Mm -hmm. I went in 2015, and that was the first time where I was like, "Wow, race doesn't really matter here." It's like mm -hmm. we gotta talk about something else because everybody looks like me. They assume that I'm from here just because of like, I guess, my cheekbones or you know whatever. It was. It was refreshing and it was a relief. Yeah. And it was like um, uh, understanding of myself in some way. Yeah. Going to Jackson, going to Jackson, Mississippi was that times 10 because you know about the migration from the south to the north, right? Everybody from Mississippi kind of went to Chicago. Yeah. And so being in Jackson after being on the East Coast for, you know, like a decade or more, I'm back with people that are like, they said, I'm making hamburgers. And without me saying my preferences, they make it the way that my grandmother would make it. Or nice. like I walk in and the family is playing a card game that I play with my grandmother mm -hmm. and my mom. Like, you know, you ever heard of Jim Rami? Him? No. That's what I mean. Because yeah. you're from the Northeast. Yeah. yeah. You know, so like. You're the only person I've heard yeah. call where I'm from the Northeast. Usually it's just the North. Just that's just how it is. Like folks from Florida be like, "Oh no, you from the north." Oh well, because they're from the south. Yeah, Texas north, oh. California north, yeah. northeast. Because Jersey, New York, mm -hmm. Boston, that is. I hear you. That's oh, okay. It's uh, just oh. when I meet people, they usually yeah. just say north for you because you're from the Midwest. That's yeah. not what. Well, where do you? No, no, I don't think from? I'm from. I'm not from a place because I moved at all these different transition okay. points. You know, okay. like. Because when you said the most important time, I'm like, all right, that's where you're from, the most important time. That's how I view things. Oh, it was the best time, but not the most important. I okay. Was, yeah, yeah. But, um. That's, I get you. I hear you. Yeah. But, I mean, you valid. You told me so many movie stories. I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, get off of anywhere. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, get, I got you. Um. So, just being in Jackson and they're like, I walk in and they're playing this game that nobody ever plays. People used to talk about spades, you know, or... I just like how to play spades a couple months ago. It's up. I don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're Jamaican. They probably have stuff that they do in Jamaica. I came from a very strict, you shouldn't gamble family. So, Domino's was like... It. Oh, yeah. Domino's. That's a very Caribbean game, right? Slap yeah. Things. Yeah. yeah. I never Tables. learned how to play Caribbean. I mean, I never played... Dominoes. But once you have the association as career and you see them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I mean. So, yeah. Um, just like everybody, like, welcoming you, like, oh, yeah, 
oh, you need a ride from the airport? Because I just kind of stopped by Jackson on accident. <laughs> I was still like, <laughs> I didn't plan on Sometimes it just comes so, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, I got, a, I got, a, yeah, diverted, I got time. flight got diverted. I know people hey. at Jackson. I'm just get off the plane. And hey, got Z. Right, yeah. That's hey, fun. can you pick me up from the airport? Yeah, let me pick you up. Let's go to the store. Let's go shopping. Let's go get you some food. That's adorable. We're going to drive you an hour to your friend's mother's house. Like, just dropped everything and mm-hmm. like... You know, we're there for me, and that's yeah. that's the type of family that I come from. So. Yeah, you with the get over here, let's dance. Get over here, let's <laughs> dance. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's that's Gary, Indiana. That's that's like the family vibe, the communal vibe that that exists there. And I don't know if it's because that's where my family is, but um, yeah, that's what it's like. I think I think every time you open up your mouth to say something, I'm like, that's so cool. Except for the most part, but everything else, so yeah. cool. But those things did make you who you are now. Is it? Is there anything you would change? Um, I don't think I would change anything because, like you said, it made me who I am now. And the struggles that I've had make it easier for me to relate to the people that I'm treating. Like my job. My job is easier, I think, and I'm able to relate to people better because I've had so many different experiences. And I've um, come from the family that I've come from. Right, well, welcome back to another episode of Mental Health Monday here with Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones, tell the folks about yourself, who you are, and what it is that you do. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Jones. I prefer jewelry. Um, I'm a pediatrician in Southeast D.C. Yes, sir. Um, I've been practicing independently for the past three years. East. Um, but I, I've been in training for residency and stuff. I started my residency in 2018. So. I've been doing this for six years totally. An amazing job. Thank you. We also have a nonprofit called Raising Risers. <laughs> My mission with Raising Risers is to kind of um, nurture black children and make sure the black community is propelled forward in a positive way. So that's my goal. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So um, at the end of the six months that I trialed it, I figured I could learn what I was learning on YouTube. Mm. Is that disappointing when you realize I could just do it myself? Be buy it on themselves. Yes. And every time I go to a hair salon, I feel that disappointment. It's like I could have done this so much better. Mm-hmm. So I just stopped going to hair salons. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, I had my friend who I met in hair school come over, and I had written out the formula for the color and everything. And so she just applied it for me. Okay. Um. And you know, I'm she's like, like a boss, but she called me a boss because oh. like. She's not comfortable with color. Mm-hmm. She struggled during that lesson period that we had about color. You didn't. Um, and she actually sent me a text message this morning, like, "Yeah, I just want to let you know you're brilliant. Your formula that you didn't." <laughs> 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 let me find out. Uh, could be a yeah. Could you yeah. If you became a salon therapist, you know, Juice. Oh, look I thought about for my youth wellness center having a hair salon in there. Mm-hmm. Um. So does this just speed up? That thought process, bringing that to life. Um, I didn't finish high school, so I don't know how that will work now if I'm not licensed. But would it be worth your time finishing those things? Because I feel like right now, with everything we talked about, girl, you got a lot. You got a lot on your plate that's about to be on your plate. Yeah, and I feel like right now, adding that, and if it's not enough or like what I'm looking for, I don't think it's worth it. Okay, um, that's. Valid. But I will come back to it, you know, once I finish being a doctor. At least you know who you are, what you're not. Right. Is there such thing as fetish being a doctor? We're hot, by the way, like the Kim. Well, I think that. Yeah, I forgot <laughs> to talk about that last. We had a great interview that 15 minutes with Nelson. I was like, oh, yeah, the red dots are all. We stopped this whole time. I see. He said, oh, man. So damn, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the best interview, though, and it's organic. Yeah. But um, what was the question? Oh, can you, you ever be done being a doctor? A doctor? Yeah. I think, um, like physically, like you don't go and do the doctoring anymore. You can stop that. But I think it's been a part of my life for so long that it would hard. It would be hard for me to just turn that part of my brain off. Like in the grocery store, I'm looking at kids and guessing their age in my head based on like what they're doing. Over, okay. you know, if I see somebody who's limping, I'm like diagnosing them or. Um, yeah, trust us. I think like twenty four hours. I think it would be hard to turn that part off. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't see myself doing the physical doctoring much longer. Than. What's your time step? Uh, so I'm hoping 
at the end of public service loan forgiveness, which is going to end for me in like two and a half years. And then, yeah, that's the thing that's holding me. Okay, so what's your plans after? Well, I've got my nonprofit that I started. Uh, oh, that was really good. It felt very healthy. Like, yeah, I'm really doing what I should be doing. <laughs> um, but yeah, my nonprofit. So I, I was inspired to actually start the nonprofit because where I work in Anacostia, like, I just felt like we are so behind as a culture. Um, and the systems in place are not doing enough to propel us forward. And so I was like, I'm going to create something that will be that force. Um, and that's why I started raising risers. So if I get that off the ground and it's sustainable and I can pay myself a salary with that, then I will stop after. Are you paying yourself a salary right now with raising risers or does it look like there's a little bit more paperwork qualifications you got to work on with your non I know that's a long question, but it's like. I feel like those things just go hand in hand at this point. Yeah. So on paper, it is an established nonprofit. It's a 5013C, but. A work that a lot of people throw at GMDC quite often. But I am uh, putting all the money into it to make it go. So until I can get some money out. How much money are you putting in it? About a year, if you don't mind me asking. Well, I started in December of 2023. So. This year, maybe I've put in probably like between five and ten thousand already. Um, is that a lot for you? No, it doesn't feel like a lot because it wasn't all at once. Okay. But when you add it all up, it's like, oh wow, I did put a lot of my salary into that, and I still had bills like a mortgage and like all this other stuff. So, nice house, Pillory. You went to my house. The old me on the silver and I was like, oh, oh yeah, well, yeah, sure. Yeah. That'd be crazy. <laughs> no, yeah, I was like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. researching. I would have seen the whole time I went to this conversation. Like, just now, you know, my one of the thousand questions. A lot of questions. A lot of questions. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. What do what expenses are you covering right now with your nonprofit? So I hosted the uh, first like community and based empowerment workshop in February. Mm -hmm. And most of that was out of my own pocket. I did partner with an organization. But are you talking about the whole joint that I checked out? The speakers and anything else? Mm -hmm. That thing was beautiful. Thank you. I'd be looking happy like that. Yeah, this is gorgeous, by the way. We got to talk about that after. Yeah. But yeah, then I, I looked at it and I was like, this is so well put together. And then I was looking at the lights, the background, the people, the podium, the microphones. The cameras, the people. Mm -hmm. and I was like, so took a lot of money. <laughs> but then I yeah. was like, I hope somebody covered the cost. Because yeah. you do want to do more of those things. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I partner with a group. It's called the Black, Black Child Development Institute of DC. Mm -hmm. um, and they help cover some of the venue costs, but that was maybe like 40% of it. So, mm -hmm. I probably, that's not personally, bad. That's not bad. That's not bad. No, that was good for yeah. my first one. Mm -hmm. um, I probably put out like three thousand mm -hmm. dollars um in total on that and then just you know like registering a business there are fees associated with it trying to get my logo trademarked and name trademarked but was that a headache because you said trying well because i'm new to this it takes a lot of research and i don't want to like just jump into something and then figure out like oh this isn't actually the right way to do it so i take my time with like going through like all of the information on the website that, or on the internet that I can find and then making a move. So I, I interviewed a trademark lawyer or a copyright lawyer and then her rate was way too high for me. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. And then I found this thing online where you can just like put in all your information and then they will handle all of the work because it's like a 12 to 18 month process to get something trademarked. Um, so <laughs> so you sprout it to the face. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah so um that was one thing and then i wanted to become more knowledgeable about business and figure out all the things that i need to have in place to make it believable and like make people want to be a part of it so i hired a business coach let's pause right here okay so you make it believable right you gotta tell me all about that well you know a lot of people are trying to be entrepreneurs you know in my daily job as a pediatrician when i ask kids what they want to be and they say i'm gonna be an entrepreneur and well what kind of business they don't no. 
I feel like a lot of people on the internet are just having businesses. So I don't want to be that. Mm -hmm. I want to be something that is established and that has longevity. And so I want to do things in the beginning to make it sustainable. So do you know what the product to your business is right now? The product is... So for you, your product would be what is your business looking to do and accomplish? Right. Uh, once you do that, then you'd figure out, all right, here's the services and here's what we're either selling or providing. Mm -hmm. And that would be the product. Yeah. So we're providing community healing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's one of the main things. Which are what you've done. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep sliding in. I'm going to reinforce all the stuff you're doing all the way. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think healing is like the overarching goal, but there are, you know, many ways that I intend to do that. So one is the community based empowerment workshops and then event what are those workshops. Those workshops include mm -hmm. um so for example, I'll tell you about my first one that we did. Mm -hmm. So we it's beautiful. Yeah. You gonna get these comments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I went to a conference and it was about black child development. And one of the things that they had during the weekend was they showed the documentary Black Boys. Where's my camera? That's the sure. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you look it up. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, but that was the first time that I saw black men and black boys openly sharing their feelings and being vulnerable. Um, and so I wanted to kind of bring that to the local community. And so most of those people in that film were like athletes or like professional athletes. Yeah. Yeah college athletes or something like that. Actually, you're looking to bring it to the ordinary man. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, you know. Man and boy. Man and boy. Yeah. yeah. Um, because in D.C., like D.C. alone, you just hear so much gun violence. Like, there's so much gun violence, um, gun violence amongst teenagers. Like, you know, 14-year-olds fighting at Brooklyn Station. Yeah. You know. I was getting to it. Right. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring that conversation to the community to hopefully dissolve some of the rage and anger that leads to violence. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got five or four black men who were successful examples of like leadership or fatherhood or both, mm -hmm. um, and just had them share their stories. And even though they were from different parts of the country, they all had basically the same experiences growing up as black boys in this country. And so the point of that was to one show like, hey, black boy in the audience, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. like everybody or a lot of people are experiencing the same thing and two you can overcome it like it doesn't have to be whatever the low expectation of society is for yeah. you you know so um that's one way that i intend to do healing i need to do some work about around black girls because i just feel like there isn't enough research even about the black girl and black woman's experience in this country do you have to do the work yes should you take your time also yes yeah because like impact I think when impact is rush, it, um, when impact is rush, it unfortunately becomes more of a conversation of looking at all the things that I've done and less of a conversation of, well, how deep was that impact felt and what did it lead to since you've done the work? Mm -hmm. And from your backstory that we've talked about, mm -hmm. which is actually going to be the next question. Mm -hmm. You've had a very hard start to get to where you are now in terms of what you thought the industry would be compared to what it actually is. So yeah. let's speak about that and take your time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I started the journey to medicine when I was 12. Sweet. Um, a flyer came home from school and it was like, do you want to be a physician scientist? And my mom asked me if I wanted to apply and I said, yes, it sounded cool. Um, I took that the SAT2 I interviewed with the program director who by the way um Dr. Moses Williams he uh was the he was part of the admissions team at Temple University Medical School Is back in like Moses uh, Moses Williams yeah he Dr. Be so Moses one both Moses Moses from the Bible yeah <laughs> started <laughs> no private now but you're not gonna get that you know that actually more now <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, he was on the admissions committee for Temple Medical School back in, like, the 80s or 90s. And he realized that there were many minorities who were, you know, being accepted into medical school. So he created this program where he would take seventh graders and basically pipeline them to medical school. Um, and so that's what I did. I was at Temple University every summer. So my family was living in Chicago. And I would go to Temple University 
to spend six weeks learning like high level science. So I'm talking like immunology, microbiology. You uh, know, we had a statistics course. We had a public speaking course. And at the end of the summer, you would have to like present on this, you know, rare disease or something. Microbes is the study of diseases. Yes. Cool. Yeah, bacteria, infections, things like that. Yeah, I went to a couple of medicine camps before going to college. I went to oh, the doctor, and then I said, "No, I don't like these people." And yeah, and it, I'm not one of those people. You don't like, like these people, as in the doctors or the, the doctors or politicians um, are very similar in terms of when things get clicked up and it becomes more about where you're not from and, and less about I. Well, what are we here to do? And I don't do well in those kind of environments because, like, I'm not good at sitting silent until we get to the finish line. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, I just know. I just know what I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'm. And that's an assumption. It's not all of them, but. Right. You but I understand what you mean. And yeah. that's part of my disappointment with, you know, mm-hmm. how, where I ended up after working for two decades towards something yeah um, when you said pipeline i was like that's like a 30-year pipeline yeah <laughs> okay all right um you know, so i'm the first doctor in my family so this entire time that i'm in this summer program mm-hmm. my family's like yeah you can do it you're gonna be a doctor like they're cheering me on they're super encouraging and i believe like yeah i'm gonna be a doctor and if i become a doctor that's gonna be so cool i'm the first one and then you started piecing the actual reality of the whole picture together as you got closer not even it's like i get into medical school i finally made it it was the only medical school that accepted me maharry medical college okay i don't know okay that's in nashville tennessee it's an hbcu yes um and so i get in and i'm just doing the work i'm not even thinking about what kind of doctor i'm going to be because my whole focus has been if i make it to being a doctor Right. Do you think that would have changed things if you thought about what kind of doctor you were going to be early on? I do, because I ended up going into a surgery program off of ambition. Okay. Um, I got a really good board score, and I was like, you know, at an HBCU, that's a huge deal. It makes you more attractive to competitive residency programs. And so I was like, yeah, I'm just going to go for the gusto. If I made it to being a doctor, I could be a pediatric surgeon. Um for the best off number of that before no I get it. did i make that up just then i don't know oh, but i like it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like a store yeah um so yeah i get i get into residency down in memphis tennessee and it's like the worst year of my life because one memphis tennessee is still very segregated so you know black people do certain kind of jobs and white people do certain kind of jobs mm-hmm. And they don't intermingle. And so I am a black woman wearing your program. Right. So I am one of two black women and I am one of three black people. Yeah. In a 40 person residency. That's not fun. I would like this. No. And part of the culture of surgery is like they say shit runs downhill. And so. (laughs) <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> well, they, that's, that's the first that came to mind. That's when you do your plumbing. Like, yeah, it runs down there. Oh, God. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I am the lowest person on the totem pole, mm-hmm. and I am supposed to be seen and not heard, mm-hmm. which goes to, like, you saying, like, not being able to speak up on something until the end. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that was very hard for me. Yeah. Um, and then all of the patients are black and all of the doctors are white. So I'm listening to these white doctors and I can't really connect with the black patients. And so that felt weird for me because mm-hmm. I'm not from the South. I'm from like, you know, the Midwest, Gary, Indiana. Baltimore. You're from Gary, Indiana? Mm-hmm. Hey, you a, you a real one. I know some folks <laughs> from Gary, Indiana, like before it got put on the map by Freddie Gibbs and them. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. I got you. Wow. Wow. What a yeah. discovery. Now I yeah. got you. So, I'm sorry. Keep going. So, like, it was just a culture shock for me. Huge culture mm-hmm. shock because now I'm in this super southern environment. Um, and the racism is just so real. I think my mom and my dad protected me from racism all the while I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And so this is the first time that I'm experiencing it and, like, recognizing what it is. And then... 
on top of that, I'm like in a trauma rotation and there are a lot of black boys and black men who are coming in victims of gun violence. There was one particular person who came in, he was 17, and he was basically dead on arrival. Like when he came through the door, you could see that his body was lifeless, but they had the compression machine pumping his chest. And the conversations around me are like, they know that he's not going, they're not going to be able to do anything to revive him, but there are a certain number of procedures you need to get in order to complete a residency program. So people are doing procedures on his body in an effort to get their numbers. Um, so then once they're all done, they put his body into an empty room with a white sheet and there's like a spotlight over him. And then his mother, who's by herself, goes in and is mourning her son. And everybody else around me has gone back to work and just no, nothing that's happened. That's yeah. And I'm, you know, as an intern, I am just observing this because I don't really have any real responsibility. And I'm able to see like all of this play out. And I'm thinking to myself, like, is this the type of person that I want to become? Like, this is so, everybody is so desensitized. That's morbid. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like callous, like the disrespect to the black body. It's just like, it's disgusting, actually. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I still kind of like pushed on, like, you know, maybe pediatric surgery rotation will be different. Maybe I'll find the fiber that I'm looking for. I got there. We were just doing appendectomies. I mean, taking out the appendix. That was like the main, the bread and butter, as they call it. And that just was not enough for me. But I still was going to go ahead because like once you match into a residency once, the culture is you should be thankful because what are the chances you're going to match into a residency a second time? And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to push through. But then... See how that's a destructive thought pattern. Yeah, that benefits the organization because yeah. then they don't lose anybody from their programs. But, yeah. but at the time, I, I was not as wise. Um, but God sent me a warning. He Like I was driving across the Mississippi River on the bridge and my tire blew and my car spun out across three lanes of traffic. Oh, Jesus. And um, there was a semi-truck that stopped probably like 50 or 100 feet before it hit my car. Yeah. And I was at the, the um, not the medium, but the barrier mm-hmm. right before I would have flipped over in, into the Mississippi River. And all I walked away was like a bruise on my forehead. So that was like a wake-up call. Like, life is too short. You can't yeah. keep living in this misery. Like, it's not worth it. And that so- was all you did have the training to know that if your car if falls into the water you're supposed to just lay your windows down as fast as possible to get out because you actually can't break windows underwater the time it takes yeah yeah i did not know that yeah, yeah. they got you made it that's the yeah. advice i learned that too much because i ain't no. <laughs> you know what's going on about this yeah that thing fall in the water try the windows down to get out yeah. that's you got like a like a 40 second window mm. 40 seconds to get the window down and get out okay yeah all right yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so after that accident, the decision in my mind was I'm either going to continue in this misery or I'm not going to be a doctor anymore. Okay. And it took a lot of courage, but I built it up to say to my program director, like, Hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. And he said, are you sure you're one of our best residents? That's how he said it. Not like, you know, not like that. Okay. Cause I was watching you like surgeons, wow. surgeons are in, kind of sarcastic and kind of dry so he yeah. didn't have that much enthusiasm in his voice but yeah. it was the most i got from him in the whole time that i had been there i felt like i was the worst resident yeah. and so for him to say you're the best you're one of the best ones let us know if you change your mind he also said people change their minds and don't finish their residencies all the time <laughs> he's selling a lot of things the one conversation i got you yeah. um yeah, so, but for me, like, once I say it out loud, I meet, like, I've already made my mind up, so I, I didn't change my mind. Um, but I still needed to work and get money. And so I ended up doing, like, what they call moonlighting. So for pediatric surgery, I was moonlighting and doing, like, a research project. And their expectation was that I would still be engaged in doing surgeries. And I said, like, I, I said that I don't like this. I don't want to do it. Yeah. How many surgeries have you done up to this point? If you took, like, a guesstimate? Uh, 
probably a hundred. It's impressive. Thanks. I don't like doing it, but it's like that's that's really impressive to go from that Thank you. to like this. Yeah. And I was helping with the surgeries. I wasn't the lead surgeon, but just still, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. you know, hey, yeah. That is yeah. one thing I miss is the procedure of surgery, just mm-hmm. like scrubbing in and like you know putting the gown on and it's putting the gloves on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so I I was uh, moonlighting for about six months until December of 2017, and yeah. and then all the while I was interviewing for pediatric. Uh, residency positions and everybody was super impressed i got way more interviews to for a search i mean for pediatrics than i did for surgery same state different state all over so like when you're applying for residencies you kind of just like cast a wide net and then see where you fall yeah um and so let's say for therapists where you get certified first date you can actually move on out with no issue right for residency but once you like make it into an attending, then you have to yeah. get licensed in one state. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, for example, like for surgery, I probably had seven interviews. For pediatrics, I probably had forty interviews. Oh, I didn't take all of them, mm-hmm. but like it was, it was a huge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everybody was super impressed. Like, oh my gosh, you were a surgeon, and so it was easy for me to match into um, pediatric residency, and also because you know I had the experience of one year of, of surgery. Mm-hmm. I was well prepared to enter and breeze through like a pediatric residency, which is a lot less intense. Um, I mean, of course, slightly things open compared to what be the equivalent for that as a pediatric. Uh, well, kids with cancer uh, well, or like, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not like it's not. That's not. I got you. Well, right. yeah. oh, you're painting out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, I ended up matching into Georgetown, and that's a very like privileged, well resourced, mm-hmm. uh, white it's environment, just, prestigious yeah. white environment. But it is white. It's very white. Yeah. To the point where it was like, there's only one black person per like every two years. Like it was me and my friend Taylor, who I went to. Um, med school went so she started with the same time as i did but i had to start over from one so she, i was the first year she was third year so you were one of two blacks within three years right okay. yeah and then there was another person that was uh next so did after she got year. yeah exactly okay. yeah mm-hmm. well that's it how is it seeing that does that do anything to you psychologically like damn well so just be- for me i had already come from memphis which uh-huh. is like I've already seen they trip. Yeah, so yeah. this is light work. Like, mm-hmm. okay, whatever. Yeah, you know. But my goal was, I'm going to take all this great knowledge that I get, and I'm going to take it back to the black community. Maybe they just don't know what's available. That was the goal. And that was that was the goal, and that's what I. Yeah, and okay. that's what I. That was my perception. That's what my understanding was at the time. So let's talk about <laughs> your perception at the top, because I think. You're very aware as a person because I'm listening to you talk and I'm like, oh, you're having all the internal dialogue conversations with you as you know. Mm -hmm. The perception of Memphis to D.C. and then Georgetown, D.C. to Southeast. Mm -hmm. How would you say it changed transitioning from GW, well, no, not GW, Georgetown to Southeast? Oh, that was like euphoria, like happiness, like because I work in a unique place where most of the doctors are black and the staff is black and the patients are black. They get the jokes. They get the jokes. So we can switch in and out. You heard of code switching? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we have our own form of code switching. It's like, you know, right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just like black excellence Mm -hmm. at its finest. It's the best environment for me. So, I mean, it was the job that I wanted when I, when I finished residency at Georgetown. So, um, I was happy with that transition. But what I have learned working with the, the community in Southeast is just that, like, there are so many, like, barriers for them. Even if they wanted to do the things and implement the things that I learned from Georgetown, like, they just can't. Right? Like, that's that a barriers. Yeah. So I'll tell a story. Okay. There was a nine-year-old boy who came to see me. Your brace stories. Oh, thank you. 
Okay. <laughs> um, so he's nine years old. And two days before, he was hit by a car. It was a hit and run, though. Mm -hmm. So he said the driver got in the car, looked at him, and got back in the car and drove off. He was walking home from school. When they walk into the office, his mom is on a walker because she only has one leg. And so I'm struggling trying to look in the computer and see like, oh, like what happened? What were the details? What did the other doctors say when they evaluated him in the ER? But I can't find it because when you go to the ER as a trauma victim, they put in like the anonymous name for you. And so the charts don't match. They don't link up right away. Like it takes some days. And so the mom didn't have any paperwork. And so I'm asking her like, hey, did you witness the accident? Like what happened? And she was like, how can I witness the accident? I only have one leg. And what I thought is like, what does that have to do with anything? But from her perspective, I could see like, you can't walk your child home from school because like, it's so hard for you to walk anyway. Right. Um, so you have to translate that. Yeah. 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 Um, they take it personally. It's mm -hmm. just kind of like, okay. So do you have to wear a face when this happens? Like these conversations, like unchanging. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll wear a face mask at work too. So that helps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the boy has two black eyes. He's got this like open wound on his forehead. Mom has like tried her best to take care of it. She's put like some gauze on it. Um, but the gauze is like stuck. So it hurts to take it off. Um, he's got road rash down the right side of his body. You know, a real rash. And Another day. Yeah. Yeah, this is a terrible this Yeah. I'm like, he simply survived getting bought by a car. No, he yeah. was like really hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And he's limping on his right leg. He can't really walk. The ER didn't give him crutches. It, it ran out? Well, I, it's, I could sure look at... Because sometimes that's a thing too. But in the ER you pretty much can get mm -hmm. what you need you might get a bill for it later depending on who's running it that's true yeah i used to be a patient advocate oh okay yeah okay. in jersey i oh. learned a lot of things okay jersey before i came here yeah maybe you can explain why he didn't get crutches then i don't know <clears throat> well two reasons could come up for something like that so <clears throat> it depends on how many resources does the hospital have right mm -hmm. So when a hospital has an abundance of resources, what comes up is we can allocate things and we can be kind because kind isn't something being kind to someone and being kind in the ability to give things away. Okay. Those are two separate things. Okay. You can give things away because you have an abundance of it or your community doesn't have a big demand for it. So it's fine. But if you have more of a demand for it and less to give away, now it's first come first serve if you have the right qualifications unfortunately mm. so do they have insurance does the insurance cover this mm. if he shows the ability to walk do we need to give them crutches when somebody else can get crutches because on this end of town a lot of these things are just commonplace you have to unfortunately be tougher mm. what you're describing is terrible i've yeah. never I've never wanted to get involved in the hospital systems in D.C. in general because of my awareness of being a patient advocate and coming from East Orange, New Jersey, and seeing what I saw there, which wasn't terrible, but understanding when I come here, there's so many things that are going on that I know there's a worse version of where I was raised here in D.C. And, and making promises to people or, oh, no, we're here to help, and it's more we're here to just get you in and out is what you're dealing with like that yeah especially the inability to make sure that the names wouldn't connect on the docs that at least create a trail where you can look back at it and see well where did things go wrong some places want things to go wrong mm. or have accepted that things going wrong is how things work here yeah i don't know eventually the charts do merge okay. but maybe it just takes so a more than two so. um yeah <laughs> just this was i was patient yeah. i get back in 2002 until about 2007 when i came on this side um yeah okay yeah so who was i oh uh, the rash right okay so 
I'm asking, like, what do you guys need from me? Do you, a lot of times specialists or the ER will say, go to your primary care doctor and get a referral to whatever specialist they recommend because of the imaging. So I'm trying to find out, like, does he have any broken bones? Does he need, does he have an internal bleed? Like, is there anything where you need a referral from me? But, and she's like, no, no, I don't think they said anything like that. And then I'm about to walk out and give them instructions for like caring for his wound on his forehead and like give them some materials and stuff. Yeah. And in this weakest voice, he says, ma'am, um, do you have crutches? Lily. And we do not have crutches at the office where I worked. Page. And that's just like really heartbreaking. And it really um, is defeating for me because like I really just want to like help the people and like give them what they need. And where and in that moment, the one thing that he needed, I couldn't provide it. And even if I, like, I looked at maybe sending a prescription for crutches, it's not possible. Yeah. And I don't even know if Medicaid would cover it, honestly. Just so, have to have a walker. We don't have, we don't have, we barely have the stuff that it takes to care for a home. At that time, or this is where you are now? Where I am now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And this this patient just came in like, you know, recently within the last six months. Wow. So, yeah. We, have you done a check in with this patient? Um, no. Did you make I have open the window on like air and that was so heavy. But that's the reality of. Yeah. And that's just one story. Air. Yeah. Yeah. And so those are the barriers. That's what I mean. Like, you know, first of all, person looks at a kid who they just hit and they just drive off. Like, yeah that's cold and heartless yeah second like mom can't even really protect her son yeah the way that he needs to be protected because she has her own stuff going on yeah, yeah. and before mental health is a topic it's like ham i can't even survive don't talk to me about mental health at this point and the, yeah yeah and then the hospital system the public insurance like you know if he like he's just not getting what he deserves really as a nine-year-old like uh. And then that makes me predict for his future. Like, will he be the adolescent that I see that is smoking weed every day? Because they can't even explain why they're doing it. It's like to calm down, to <laughs> deal with stress because I get irritated. And they don't realize that that's like you're just numbing your experience. You're not really living. Yeah, but you also can't talk to somebody about having the proper emotional tools if the environment that they're in is really providing them the proper tools mm -hmm. like crutches when I get hit by a car and I have road rash yeah 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 so that's why I mean like healing that trauma is going to stick with him I don't know how it's going to manifest mm -hmm. but like I at least want to be able to give our people the capacity to talk about stuff like that like how did that make you feel I think there there is a lot that comes from just saying something and saying your emotion is like oh God. that's something I actually had to learn myself like through therapy just like being able to identify the emotion that I'm feeling and that makes me feel a lot better like there's a load taken off of my shoulders mm -hmm. I feel like I used to have a lot of just like pent up stuff and entanglement of stuff that I didn't even know what it was or couldn't even start to identify it and it would just come out as tears sometimes I didn't even know why I was crying like I can't, or like a knot in my throat. I don't even know why there's a knot in my throat, but I haven't felt that in years. So I just want to give that same thing to, to the community. So as a pediatrician, mm -hmm. right? How does that relate to mental health and therapy now in terms of work that you're looking to do as a therapist? How does being a pediatrician relate to mental health? You mean I feel like 80% of my job is mental health. Like, so all of the, so let's say a patient comes in for their checkup, mm -hmm. they they get an emotional developmental screener, and I have to assess them and look and see like, oh, are you depressed? Are you anxious? How are you doing in school? Sometimes, you know, the mental health of a person manifests in their behavior and performance at school. So... I always, I always have to check in and see like, oh, does the patient, does this patient have an IEP? That's an individualized education plan. Um, do they receive counseling? Why are they receiving counseling? Um, and so a lot of times too, the teacher or the parent will say, I think the child needs to be tested for ADHD and medicated. 
And I'm like, well, how long has his sleeps? I do, because I'm like, how long has this behavior been different? Because I don't see anywhere in the history that this has been a problem. Oh, in the past year. Well, did something happen? Like, did somebody die? Did somebody... Um, is that a fly that keeps coming up my head? Yeah. All right, because I was like, Edna, what is that? I'm sorry. I like, was waving. I was trying to see it. I was like, I don't even see anything. <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep going. <laughs> I was like, why does it just keep doing that to her? And I'm showing right now. I'm sorry. Um, they're like, well, did something happen? Did somebody die? Mm-hmm. Is their dad around? Like, And then usually they'll be like, oh, yeah, well, you know, grandma died last year or my boyfriend just moved in or like you know there's always an environmental change that can usually explain why the kid is acting differently um and so yeah that's how mental health is part of my job for the teenagers like the the depression screen like we flat out are asking them questions about depression like you know sleeping that like are you sleeping more are you more tired are you eating less are you eating more are you less interested in what you're supposed to be doing um and so yeah mental health is just part of like my daily daily patient encounters oh, they, but you manage all our parents yes yeah. okay. in managing these parents do you feel that how these parents supposed to put food on the table and also take care of this child's mental health needs and they also have their own mental health yeah problems so yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So the list for us as adults has just gotten larger. Isn't it? With less resources to do it. Yeah. Would you say it's a privilege to be able to go to therapy if you get help? Yeah, it's because the wait lists for therapy are extremely long. Mm-hmm. And I've heard before, like, getting a therapist is like dating. Getting a good therapist is like dating, right? Like, you know, you got to go through a few before you find the right one. And a lot of times people don't have patience. First of all, for black people, it's hard enough to even say and like agree, like, yes, I'm going to go get therapy. And then when it doesn't work out, yeah. then you're like, oh. So you want me to break up and do that? All this guy? <laughs> yeah. Or somebody else's one? I told you it wouldn't work. Just like, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I forgot the original question, but. Yeah, I, mean, I forgot too, but you, you was making all these good points. I'm like, nah, I keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it is a privilege to get therapy um, because also therapy costs, right? Like, especially good therapy. They have a lot of like free therapy. I know therapists who are prescribing medications and they've never seen the person. Let me make sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, after everything you described, are you really going to be able to see the person when you got all that going on? Virtually, maybe. Uh, Are they trying to see the person that they're prescribing things to? Magic is a part Right? You said in a whisper. Class <laughs> series. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. I got you. I got you. Stay left. <laughs> and, like, the parent is begging. Like, I really, I really want another therapist because this person has never seen me and they never will. And, you know, I really think I deserve better. It's like, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, you know, also having a child, a pediatric therapist, that's even more privileged, right? Because that's a specialized group of people. And there aren't, one, that many therapists to begin with. And then, two, not that many people that go into pediatrics because it's additional training, right? So, um, so what's the difference between a therapist and a pediatric therapist? I think there is a, and, you know, so I'm just a, a very unique why right now. Yeah, and I'm just a pediatrician. I work with a uh, child psychologist closely. I believe there is an understanding of development and like the range of normal, right, for kids at all ages. Yeah. Where I don't know that an adult therapist has to have that reference, you know, because you could say, oh, I think he's hyperactive, but he's also three. So like, where is the where is the limit of hyperactivity that's acceptable for a three-year-old? I think that's something that a, a child therapist needs to be aware of. Good joke. Yeah. I'm fascinated by you. Oh, thank Just you. To be honest, yeah. Thank you. Because um, outside of us meeting, which I still find hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Kira. Yeah, thanks, Kira. <laughs> Shout out to Uno. <laughs> it's um your experience being a pediatrician, your experience being a therapist, and the people that 
you work with, you touch on the side of these people need resources outside of just sitting down and talking. Because if I sit down and talk and I go back home to the same problems, that all I'm doing, all you're doing as a therapist for somebody in that environment is you're making my problem loud. We no solution. They did. What do you say to someone that comes from that environment and says, so you want my problems to be louder with no solutions? Really good. Right. I say I'm working on the solution. Okay. Go you know, to, to do. As um, you've done a lot, but a lot is never enough. But you start from where we come from. Yeah, that's true. That. You know, I really feel like it starts with the children. You know, the adults. Unfortunately, like no. old habits die hard. It's all it done. And <laughs> I was it sounds just cool. Not it's to like say that, but it's just. I mean, all right. So, as an adult, we're really good at joking about our pain because that's the jokes is what we have left. We're still working on the pain, working on ourselves. Hopefully, you find the right person that understands you. Mm-hmm. If you don't, hopefully. You have no issue with just being by yourself and accepting yourself for who you are. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's very hard to change who you've been all your advice. So, when someone comes to you and says, well, you need this, this, and this, you kind of look at those people and you think, well, where were you when I met you? Yeah. And that's what it means to be an adult. Mm-hmm. Being an adult means... You're not surprised when you told you have problems. You kind of just assume, yeah, I'm going to have problems. I'm an adult. Mm. But you're more disappointed or aware of the fact that I may not be willing to change after I find out the thing you tell me about because that thing is actually how I've been able to survive all this time. Right. Yeah. But part of my work or part of my decision to become a pediatrician is that people will rally around a child. Yeah. You know, and they will rally around their child. Mm. And you can learn from your child. Yeah. And so if I teach your child to say, for instance, yesterday I had a friend come over, my friend who did my hair. Uh, job, thank you. <laughs> She's like, hey, girl, hey, you got me out of the way. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so she has a nine year old and she's been working with helping her nine year old express feelings. They went to see Inside Out, too. Okay. I highly I heard, recommend I it. That movie. Didn't that break records? I don't know, yeah. but I went to see it twice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. I saw Deadpool. Um, Deadpool Wolverine. That was fun. I had to check that out. I was just, um, great movie. Great. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, this is the first time that her daughter has been to my house and we're going down to my basement where I have like an art studio set up. And she says... Oh, I'm starting to feel envy. Have you heard a nine-year-old say that? No. No. <laughs> right. No, it's usually the J word. Jealous. Right. Yeah. So I was impressed, one, that she knew what envy was, and two, <laughs> that she could even express that openly, and she felt comfortable to say that. Her mom is learning through her, like, how to accept that type of conversation and how to, you know, foster it and let it grow. Like, And she's becoming more comfortable with her own emotions as a result so you know that's my approach like get the children get the children mold them yeah and then the adults in their lives will learn something from that but more importantly the children of those children will be better off and her mom's willingness to create that space mm-hmm. yeah what kind of person is her mom um well she is a pisces oh she she's one of these oh, i'm a pisces too what oh Oh my goodness. What year are you? February or March? March 17. Oh, you got the same birthday as my friend Jasmine. I'm 13. Her birthday is at my friend yeah. Jasmine. Her my, birthday is the 17th minus the 13th. My friend who brought her daughter is the 13th. Kip. <laughs> wow, okay. That's 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 kind of creepy. Yep. Got it. Got it. Wow. And we're both wow. last name Jones. <laughs> Yo, that's that's crazy. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, but yeah, so it's like a movie moment. Okay, uh, yeah, oh, this was meant to be, dude. Yeah, yeah. So um, she's a Pisces. She's a teacher. Mm-hmm. She teaches second grade, also third grade. Okay. Um, she. I met her in hair school. Okay. So she's a hairstylist. 
Um, she's from New York. Um, but she's just a really, a really genuine and open person. She's very open to learning. Um, which I'm similar. So I'm so really open to learning, open to hearing feedback. She's open to hearing feedback. I, I really could choose my days for feedback. I hear it. It hurts my feelings, but yeah. then I like take yeah. it in after. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you had a point on what you said. Yeah, and no, I get that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So like, I I think she's an amazing mom, and I think all parents should kind of have some of those same qualities. And um, to hopefully. best nurture nurture their kids. Yeah, hopefully, because mm-hmm. there's some who have those qualities and they take it in the wrong direction. Like, oh no, I, I know you. I've learned everything. And it's all, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Whoa, well, and I had to control. We're here to just understand. Right. Not understand in order to use and manipulate. Yeah. That's I've learned everything. That's problematic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think yeah. you learned exactly what you wanted to tell them about. If that was it. Yeah, no. No, no, no I got you. Yeah. Yeah. So many times, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but where do you go from here? It's not the end of the cover. It's just yeah. Now that a picture has been painted a little bit clear in terms of you finally found the right environment to help the community you would like to help, mm-hmm. but you see how many resources are scarce. How does someone like you, always knowing man? There's a lot of work to do here. It's definitely intimidating. Um, but it's where I find my fulfillment. Okay. So it's like a, it's a non-negotiable. Like I have to do it. I have to at least try. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like there are so many things that have historically set us back. I recently watched a documentary about crack in the 80s. Um, that was a <laughs> <laughs> you basically feel like, oh, stop, 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 stop. Um, yeah, so I want to do something that will, for once, propel us forward. Um, and I think it just starts with conversation. That's going to be my first thing. Like, I thought about having, like, in addition to the, the men's empowerment, like, with the Black Boys documentary, having, like, daddy-daughter movie nights with, like, emotional cartoons. That way it will foster a conversation. Maybe doc- daddy-son will be nice because dads need to talk to their sons about emotions, right? Yeah. Um, what days you want to do this? These are things I want to be a part of. Okay. Yeah. I just literally got this movie idea like two days ago. So uh-huh. I'm still like. If you want to send you the interview, it'd be like, remember, these, this is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Put this. I can't. We're going to do this. So we are. Yeah. Come in soon. Um, empowering black girls. I actually just talked to my friend about, you know, how the boys get their hair cut for back to school. They do the free haircuts. Why can't the girls get their hair braided for free? Like, big like, shot. I know that was a shock when I opened the door. You were like, oh, Yo, your hair is gone, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so just like doing things to make girls feel seen and feel beautiful. Um, also, with the, the uh, men's empowerment, like community based empowerment workshops that I'm doing for. Uh, 2025 will add an emotional processing component. So, so your calendar is already planned out for 2025? Partially. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's get yeah. into this emotional uh, processing unit that you're working on right now. You, yeah. you flexing hard. I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, this is very, oh my God, my. Yeah. Yeah. So I've just been working with, you know, because I work with child psychologists, just yeah. like they came to my first event, they saw the film. And so, based on that film, we've been just like, Developing questions that can foster conversation that will promote healing. How many child psychologists are you working with? Two. I need to get in contact with these folks to interview them too. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you put them on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. So that's the beginning of my work. And then hopefully with community support, I will. Um, good luck. That was good. That was good. <laughs> You're going to feel that. I will um, have the finances to open up a youth wellness center in D.C. where kids can come and get all the things that they need. Are you doing work with uh, youth centers now in D.C. around your way? Or I have the kind of things have already been pre-established. So it's like 
pick and choose where to do your work. Yeah, I haven't thought much about collaborating. It's a good idea, but I just have so many ideas in my head. And there's only one you to go about. That's true, too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just gonna it, it's a learning journey for me, right? Because I'm, I'm a doctor, not a business person yet. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm learning, right? And so as, as I talk to more people, then I will think of more ways that I can do my work on a broader scale without it just having to come from me. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. That's, How do you feel about the work that you've done so far? Um, I know that I've made an impact just on just from the conversations that I've had with patients in 20 minutes. Um, and I feel good about that, but I don't feel like it's enough. I don't feel unsatisfied, unsatisfied with that. And then, honestly, and I fulfilled. That's why I like this nonprofit is non negotiable for me because that's where I get my fulfillment with like career stuff. Do you have any questions to ask me? I know I'd be asking my questions. CD said, I'd be this stuff. You know what, Janice? Like a good question, person. Yeah, I was wondering if this is going to be like a one way interview because I'm mean, used to interviewing I mean, people. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just, to me, I think of it as a conversation, but like mm -hmm. I get to ask you other questions that I didn't get to ask in that first phone call. Yeah. I didn't even review that first phone call. I was like, I just want to talk when she pulls up. We just going to chat. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. I was like, that. The bars you dropped in that, I was like, nah, that's that's for another sit down for another time. I just want to hear about you. Yeah. Well, my question for you was like, did you grow up being in touch with your emotions? If not, when did you I'm Jamaican learned? That means no. That's not part of <laughs> there are not just thoughts. Are you in touch with your emotions now? Yeah, yeah, more than I'd like to be. So okay. um I used to be called stoic. And I get that comes from being viewed as someone who's strong. Mm -hmm. But I think the reason I'm viewed as stoic is because when I set a goal, people see that I really put my all into getting to that goal. But putting your all into something means you show an immense amount of emotion to accomplish it. And that's just what it looks like. So mm -hmm. my mom is in an emotional person I, I was never given tools to deal with my emotions as a child between my mom and my dad but i was given the tools that they had <laughs> so i'm not like you you should have done better by me nah i'm more so like all right now that i have to drive from my mom when it comes to planning things and execution for my dad i he might get frustrated about the wrong things i don't what that I believe that how I how do I deal with my frustrations? Because you adapting or realizing what you're adapting from your parents as you grow up doesn't mean you don't inherently have a different version of that. Like mm -hmm. oh, like saying I don't want to be that thing. That doesn't mean you don't become the thing. That means you're consistently working to not become the thing. My dad was like super educated. Like he was the type of person to say, hey, go read the encyclopedia. And I was the type of kid to say, why the hell would anyone read the encyclopedia? <laughs> yeah. like, like, the, like my parents would suggest things that to me didn't help me and what I saw for myself. Because like even when uh, my mom told me to be a patient advocate mm -hmm. for the summertime, because that was my mom's suggestion when I was in New Jersey. I didn't know what empathy meant and I didn't know that I was an empathetic person, but to me, it's not hard to care about people. But after the care, I don't know if I could help you, which are two separate things. Like as a patient advocate, I'd walk around the hospital. I deal with a couple of patients that had HIV and other patients who just had harms and issues with the hospital. And I would listen to what they are either complaining about or not being heard on. Like they spoke to someone and it wasn't changed. And then I'd go to the higher ups and say, hey, why hasn't this person gotten new pillows yet? Or why isn't this person getting rolled? Because they're starting to get sores on their body. Mm -hmm. And after doing that through high school, I went to college and I realized that made a difference in the person's life for like five minutes or a day or two. But how much of this work in our hospitals actually doing because they care about their patients versus liabilities. Liabilities is kind of one of 
the worst words to be invented when it comes to getting people help because a lot of things don't happen because of the L word liability. We can't do that due to liability. We can't handle that due to liability. We don't touch that due to liability. I know. But and to, what it really comes down to is it opens up the bigger door of how much the bigger organizations either don't have the resources or those resources are being allocated to different places. That's not the place you're trying to help. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to my emotions, I learned how to be in touch with my emotions from my last relationship. Uh, my best friend, Nisha, who passed away in 2018, and she's the whole reason this entire platform exists. Mm -hmm. So am I, in, in, am I in touch with my emotions? I mean, way more now than I was back in the day. But I think I think I was an emotional fuck. I was like really emotional as a teenager. I was I was wilding for love. I didn't know what love looked like, but I know I wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I'll take a tall glass of that. <laughs> but I mean, you know, even that, like, like parts of my life is like a lifetime movie. Like this young lady who I was in love with in, in high school before my last relationship, before going to college, she got pregnant by someone while we were working on each other. And I didn't know she was pregnant. And then she ended up having the baby leaving the baby at a lawyer's doorstep in Jersey City and a whole bunch of other shit. And then I had to like watch her get married and DJ at her wedding before going to college. That fucked you up. Why did you DJ at her wedding? I had to give that nigga something because I wasn't giving her me. Mm -hmm. After that, like, you know, that's one of my homies and shit like that. But it's like you, we were like really close friends. So you realize your really close friend is pregnant. You realize you're really close yeah. friend had nowhere they could turn to. Mm -hmm. You realize your really close friend who's from Jamaica and that her mom that's not her mom's actually her aunt has to get married to some nigga that she went to school with. It's not you, my nigga. Here Cause she Here needs a more than a green card. Here you. you get the fuck out of Jersey, you're not coming back. There's nothing you could tell me to send me back to New Jersey. Are you coming back? No, I'm like I like not dealing with my pain, guys. Man. Yeah, so and that's not the only reason. I just don't think there's enough opportunities in Jersey for somebody like me. Like getting around, sitting down, working on work opportunities. It's just different. The politics in New Jersey are different. The politics is really who do you know? The politics in DC is where were you when you bumped into them? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's how the dynamic and everything works. You just move differently. So when it comes to my emotions, though, I think I'm not only more tapped in with my emotions, I actually deal with my emotions. Like in my my last relationship, when I started, I was very closed off. I was the shut down person. You say something wrong to me, I'm just going to turn it off. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? You turn that thing. I'm just like, yeah. But now I'm, I don't turn it off. I am more willing to get angry and sit in the anger or the emotion that I'm feeling because anger is the only emotion that I have. I have like a mix of emotions that I've put words to, which I'm much better at. Mm -hmm. I am the type to come back to you later like, hey, I know what happened. Do you have time to talk? Because I'm not going to force the conversation on you. Pisces love forcing the conversations on people. Really? I don't. Yeah, a lot of them. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have someone in your family that used to trap you like that? My mom. My mom. My mom did that. So when she yeah. did that, I was like, I, I don't want to trap people with a conversation because it's like people who do that are afraid of rejection. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. You're afraid of giving someone the choice to not talk to you now. And that comes from a fear of if I don't talk to you about this now, I'll never have a chance to talk about it. But that's a you thing. You're making it about yourself. So even if you're trying to apologize or you're trying to tell me what's wrong. You're not giving someone a chance to be open to hearing what you have to say. And not everybody needs to hear what the hell's going on with you. Mm -hmm. So as someone that does better with my emotions that has upgraded from shutting down to I will get defensive, but I'll dismantle the defenses in a couple of hours and come back to you if you're free to want to have the conversation or another time. But it yeah. uh, I won't be passive aggressive. I'm a very petty person. I'm really learning how to. Not be petty. Is that a Pisces thing too? I can I, I could like want to know hard about myself right now. But I really learned not to be petty because it's like being petty means you put so much energy and resources into not doing the right thing. 
Okay. And you're doing everything you can to not find a solution just to get payback. But each day you get payback, that doesn't mean you're paying yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'd rather put money back in my pocket or spend my emotional equity the way that I see fit mm -hmm. versus I, I feel better now that I see you miserable. You know, you really build relationships with people just so you can see them be miserable when you want them to be. That's not, yeah. I'd rather not be that. I'd rather tell you fuck off and stay out of my life than mess with you because I could just see you hurt when I want you to. That's how the relationship before last ended. And I was like, nah, that's not going to work. I thought, even though we broke up, I thought then it was my homie. And then I realized you don't want to see me happy. You want to have access to seeing me not be happy. Pretty good. I should be happy away from you. Yeah. I, sh I should go. So they blocked me and I was like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> I hope that answer your question. That's yeah, the best answer I got. That was great. I mean, that was a very well-rounded answer to that question. Thanks. My other question for you was like, what's your wellness routine? <sighs> I lay in bed for 25 minutes when I first wake up. I don't get up and get straight to it. Like, you know, hustle culture my mom i don't think my mom has missed working a saturday every day of my life since i've been born like i've been to her job my mom is a reference for a lot of things just let you know mm -hmm. so my mom has always worked another job even when she worked at east orange shadow hospital in east orange mm -hmm. my mom after getting fired continued to work her side hustles because life doesn't end mm -hmm. and even after college my mom continues to work now to this day and even if I made like amazing money to pay for things, my mom would continue to work because I think she's one of those people that A, needs to have a purpose, but B, unfortunately, if she doesn't do what needs to be done, I don't know if things would be where they need to be at all in Jersey. So, and that's not at the detriment of my dad. It's just he's sick. You feel what I'm saying? And when you're taking care of a person who's sick, that person may not be realistic about what their limitations are or not. And you being sick doesn't mean people love you less, but there is a separate struggle that the person who is sick has from the person that is supporting the person who's sick. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, wait, what's the question? Cause what's I, your well wellness routine? You said you lay in bed for 20 to 25 minutes. Yeah, 20, 25 You're minutes. doing nothing or are you like on your phone? Yeah, no, no, no. When I'm laying in bed, I'm actually going through. Um, so, my partner has chronic pain. She suffers from fibromyalgia and endometriosis mm. and a couple other things. And I didn't date her because of that. I, I, no, I hope not. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Just, just to be clear, she, she shot her shot at me. I was like, oh, okay, this is... But I didn't know she was shooting her shot at me. I thought she was just someone that, like, one of the services from Gallup and Safer was just inquire about what we were doing. But she was mm -hmm. interested in me, which was crazy because I say it all the time. I after my last relationship, I didn't want another relationship. I didn't want anything from God. I didn't want anything from people. I just wanted to help people. Okay. And that was like, for me, I was fine with that. Because it's like the life I had before this life, I lived a lot of life. I'm not looking forward to dying, but I lived a lot of life that to me was very satisfying in terms of like that love that I was looking for. That tall glass, mm -hmm. hell of a tall You glass. mean before your get home safe life or... You know, was like, last relationship. Oh, you're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was okay. a tall class. Of just, so this is good. This is really good. And then it was gone. And I was like, this is, I don't want, I don't want to taste nothing else. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's what grief looks like sometimes. Mm -hmm. So my wellness routine is to lay in bed for 25 minutes and really think, how much do I have to give? And the reason I bring up my partner having chronic pain is because people who suffer from chronic pain, they have this spoon method that they tell you about how many spoons do I have for the day? Mm. not everyone has the same amount of spoons so for people who are sick they may have two spoons those two spoons may mean that i today i'm able to get up brush my teeth wipe my ass take a shower eat breakfast and work for half the day even if i'm working a remote job because i have so much chronic pain that just sits in my body i may not have the ability to do anything else versus okay i could get up and do all those things and i could also put up art on the wall I might be able to cook food today mm -hmm. and then I might be able to have conversations with my family because sometimes chronic pain doesn't just mean you're physically exhausted. It also means 
do I emotionally have the capacity to deal with these folks after dealing with the amount of pain that I have? Me being an able-bodied person and not having any chronic pain, I really sit down and I'm like, okay, but I get to pick and choose what do I want to deal with today? Mm-hmm. Do I want to have the hard conversation with my mom? Do I want to hit on my best friend and be like, hey, why aren't we talking anymore? What has changed? Am I willing to just go to the gym, do a couple of interviews today, eat some lunch, keep it moving? Mm-hmm. Those are like questions for me. And those 25 minutes really afford me the time to figure out who am I willing to be and who am I willing not to be today? And that's usually how I start my wellness journey for the day. I don't do face masks. She tells me I need to clean my face even though I have green skin, but it's like, nah, my skin be dry because I'd be outside doing work stuff. But I'm like, no, nah, I gotta stay on sunscreen, no. What she gave it to me, I use it. I don't have my own stuff. I use a lot of her stuff. Shoot, I'm, I'm great for I'd be lying I just get a bottle and get more free. Let me know how much it costs. I'll pay you back. Nah, I got you. I got you. You know, I just got the haircut too. So it's like, you know, I got Murray's right there over on you. I just got like three brushes, you know, okay. soft, medium, hard. You know, I'm back in the game. Got my little silky do rags right there. Oh, up yeah. That joint right there. That used to be my big bonnet. Now I got my do rags over there. You know, stuff that I do. I stretch. I stretch for like 20 minutes. Um, I used to do pro tryouts for like 2012, like summer of 2011 or so until the beginning of 2017. I did pro tryouts for the NFL, CFL, and Arena Football League. And the thing is, when you are strong and explosive and allied and athletic, you you gain a lot of things becoming strong. You tear tendons. Sometimes you break bones. Yeah. Sometimes you have a stress Achilles that's been stressed since 2009 or present. It, what happens is with all that strength that you've, you've accumulated, when you stop working out, the pain doesn't go away. And so I have to do a lot of body maintenance. So like... I could get underneath a bench and bench five hundred, sure. Mm-hmm. But can I not hurt all day after? Yeah, you know, right. for that five hundred that I was chasing all my life, even though I'm here, and it's right. like, nah, you gotta maintain your body. So mm-hmm. I do a lot of deep stretching. Uh, sometimes I'll even do breathing exercises in my free time. Like I don't get extreme forms of anxiety, but sometimes I get tight because you know anxiety sometimes shows in your body physically. Right. And I do a really good job of breathing exercise my way back down to earth, like meditation. Yeah, but with my eyes open. Oh, okay. And my, I think that's like you know the best version of. It. I wish I had a much more strenuous wellness routine, but that would take time. And I don't have a lot of time. I just yeah. If you see the thoughts that are in my head, which you shouldn't visit my head anytime you get a chance, you're, you're good. But it's just <laughs> like you know, I know as I said, those twenty five minutes goes towards who am I willing to be, who am I not willing to be, and then sometimes in those twenty five minutes. Uh, especially how I start my day, I'll sometimes think about, all right, the things that you said you were going to do yesterday, did you do them? Mm-hmm. And if you didn't do them, did something get in the way or did you choose to change your mind? Because it's really important to acknowledge I changed my mind and what's leading to your change of mind and is what you're trying to do really necessary then? Because mm-hmm. you really got to understand the things you want to do in life are things that you should want to do. And when you don't want to do them, Sometimes your actions show what you really don't want to do. Yeah. So. Yep. I know that very well. Um, so. I think even though you don't think that's a robust wellness plan, I think that's a pretty robust wellness plan. Is it? Yes. I ask men all the time what their wellness routine is, and they know they have one. Oh, showers too. Showers are nice. That's just basic hygiene. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a difference between I take a good shower to be clean versus I enjoy yep. the shower. Like. What soaps do I have? Oh, okay. I need my bathroom. There's yeah. like seven to eight different soaps with different smells. Okay. Some yeah. shouts. Sometimes I'll take the soaps with the beads in it. You know, the extra joints that explode. It's just yeah. like, nah, that stuff. I think that's like really important to have like moments like, hey, if you're going to do it, do it correctly. Mm-hmm. Because like, did you really experience it? Or yeah. do you have the army mentality? If, hey, we're trying to save all water. It's a luxury, obviously. But yeah. 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 Okay. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to ask, like, Mm -hmm. you said, like, you plan out what you're, what you have the capacity to do for the day. What if something happens in your day? Are you so committed to completing what you set on your checklist? Or are you flexible and pliable enough to say, like, yeah, that happened. And now I don't have the scones to, to do all the things. So my shutdown back in the day has moved from one thing to another mm-hmm. right so i used to shut down from an argument mm-hmm. what i notice is 
if my day doesn't go well, I'm more willing to shut down and take two hours to myself to willow. Willow it a little bit because like I get really excited for all this stuff that I, I mean, you saw my text messages two days. I was like, hey! Hey, oh my! We're looking for a But you may realize when you do the stuff that we do interview wise and mental health wise and just having these conversations, you need to create excitement before you get to sit down with people because people get nervous. If you don't create excitement, oh. they might come through like, we scheduled this thing. We haven't talked in two months. Now you want me to sit down and be friendly with you? You ain't touched me, nigga. What happened? What happened to us? We supposed to have snack time. We got other stuff. stuff. And it's like, nah, you need... Sometimes, if you really want a good product and you really want to enjoy people's time, you have to let them know, hey, I really enjoy being around you. Yeah. You like that. 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 People can't just, oh, I liked you last time, so I'll like you later. No. <laughs> That's all right, yeah. People tell me, I don't talk to people for a long period of time. And they were like, you're always the same. <laughs> it was the handling. You're always the same. No, 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 no. What do you What are people doing out here? They're not the same? No, they're not. <laughs> that's, that's actually a thing. But um, what was I saying? Uh, I was asking if you have, if you allow yourself to take away spoons, depending on like how your day goes. So... If my day goes really bad, I get food. Uh, I get I get food. I look up. I eat breeds. I don't like Uber Eats. As a product, Uber Eats has gotten way worse from where it was before. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to spend a bunch of money. I don't know if you saw that um, that TikTok where the guy, I think he was getting food from Walmart or something like that. And he had like 21 items. And then in 2022, it cost like $128 for the 21 items. But now, in 2024, it costs like and some change for those saying oh my god and so that's how much inflation has yeah. the price of groceries but i don't know if you notice when the prices go up they don't ever go back down it's a very rare case where things go back down when inflation is gone so now we're in a world where people who used to have more resources and money it's a lot less mm -hmm. so how i used to deal with a bad day has changed because it's like yeah sure you want to spend that money yeah you sure you want to splurge Cause you might splurge for the last time for two months. Mm -hmm. That's when inflation has died. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll complain out loud. I'll go up to my girl. Hey, you got time to talk? I'm going to get a bitch. Like, <laughs> and then we'll chat. Mm -hmm. and, and I always ask this question. Hey, am I tripping? Mm -hmm. Because I think what I'm upset about when my day has gone wrong isn't that my day has gone wrong. I'm more upset about what did I do for my day to go wrong and could you let me know if I'm tripping? Because it's not my job to be right. I think it's my job to be wrong and the people around me to hopefully correct me if I'm wrong. And if I'm right, hey, we're doing a good job of trying. Mm -hmm. So I think right is usually a measure of trying and getting it right either at that moment or later down the road. And that's usually how I measure my days. Yeah. Does that mean that God doesn't have a play in your day? Like... The fact that you think that I think about that all the time. I used to say, "What if it was just meant that the day was going to be shitty today? Like you had nothing to do. You couldn't have changed it if you wanted to." I, I think that's giving God a little bit too much credit. You think so? Yeah, I think God mm -hmm. was like, "Look, man, I made you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I gave enough in making you. So like, okay. the reason I say I hated God, and I think I think uh, people trip out when you say, "How could you say you hated God?" Mm -hmm. All right, so you're telling me God is like Santa Claus, right? Okay. So this man is supposed to give us all these gifts, right? And you don't think the man that gives you gifts get the gifts wrong sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, in my last relationship, I felt God took her away from me. Mm -hmm. That was my, I was like, how could you give me someone and something so beautiful and take them away and think, I'm just going to fuck with that? Mm -hmm. But then it's like, yeah, but if, if God was involved in this, you also have to admit that you put that person in your life mm -hmm. and you wouldn't have had that person without okay no one told me that this is just self-conversation i eventually came to that answer mm -hmm. i'm so hey but so i uh, maybe i fuck with the blow <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. we are a lot of people are born with religion we're raised with religion right mm -hmm. but not enough of us admit when our relationship with religion and god because i think those two things are separate mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. and how we go about that relationship like 
people who are holier than thou, people who are holier than thou, some doctrines dictate, hey, God is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Word. So God's everywhere at all times, yes. Okay. So when I'm having sex before marriage, God's there too. Well, I don't know about that. Oh, you got you guys said something. Yeah. Stick, yeah. stick to what you're putting out there. So, like, I think it's okay to be upset with God, but I think it's also okay to acknowledge what He's given you. If you think He's given you diseases and He's made your life miserable, you acknowledge what God has given you. If you're, if you think God has been the person that has given you all the blessings and the relationships that you have, then you know. Take what God has given you and acknowledge that. If you think God is unfair to you, then be angry with God and acknowledge it's unfair. But like, you know, I don't blame him for the decisions that I made. When that those are two separate things. I made a lot of those decisions. I was yeah. not I was not the greatest kid growing up. I think my parents did a, a great job with me, but I don't think I was the greatest kid. Mm -hmm. But I think I do spend a lot of time of figuring out, all right, well, where, where did the greatness stop and where did it start and what can I work on? So, yeah. you know, that's that's my point of view on things. Kind of switching gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were training to be in the NFL or you tried out to be in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that a dream that you had? Like when you were eight years old, you're like, I'm going to the NFL. You no, know, my parents, my parents facilitated. You were going to read books. You were right. very educated. You were Jamaican. All right, I'll beat the shit out. You boy, you're going to be educated. That's, yeah. that's just what it was. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I... I think right before I got to high school, I came to realize I don't think there's anything that I'd like to do because I want to do it. I think most people are like, well, watching TV? No, the TV is there. When you do something, like doing something is I'm in a book club because I like to read books and I like to talk to other people right. who read books. Mm -hmm. That's doing something. Mm -hmm. um, and the running track, I like to be fast. I like the feeling of running. I do give me give me some shorts on a on a thirty seven degree day. I'm going to be running down the street because that's what runners do. That's right. your cases, right? Because their body heats up and they're able to deal with the cold with no issue. You. Right? For me, playing football was my mom. When I decided to play football, my mother said he's not going to last a week, <laughs> and I said, "Talk about what they should." and she in the for the first two years she was like you know he said he was gonna play it and i told him he would have last and he still last thing <laughs> and it's like that's not bragging you're just you're reinforcing my love for the thing that i chose to do because i don't think it's a parent's job to believe in the things their kids want to do i think if you have a parent that's like that you're lucky and if your parent decides to believe in the thing that you like to do or you like to be, it's nice to have. But belief starts with you. Uh, like, and don't get me wrong, I've had other things my mom believed in when it came to me, but I felt that was more like, oh, you want to sing for the choir in church? Oh, that's nice. Go ahead and sing. And I'd be like, all right. Oh, you want to you wanna do hip hop dancing and battling in the streets? No, I don't like that. People get shot. <laughs> and I'd be like, I'm not even gonna go do the hip hop dancing thing. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't sound like a lot of my decisions came to her saying no, no, she just happened to say no. And unfortunately the things that she chose that were no, I actually liked a lot. So, you know, she just did her eat the wrong drug and so on. But I always thought as a parent, she did a good job of caring mm -hmm. or trying to care. Mm -hmm. Just sometimes parents get in the way and sometimes parents do a good job. She happened to be both. Yeah. So, did you make it to the NFL or you didn't? No, never signed a contract in the NFL. Well, Played you a trial just for Cowboys. Then I did uh, 32 teams for all 32 teams of the NFL Combine. But remember, I had a stress Achilles since 2009. So, my trials were like 2012 forward. You got a stress Achilles? I don't care who the hell you are. Stress, the stress Achilles? Stress I don't even run anymore because I got a stress Achilles. Do you? Yeah. Which leg? Both. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, left. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, you're not just bad having stress kills. You have stress killers and you're heavy. Mm -hmm. So, like, every time you do it, you're going to feel it. You know, stress Achilles hurts you the most. You can do sprints, you're fine. But, like, distant running, mm -hmm. and you need to be able to do distant running to get faster. Yeah. And you can do sprints. Don't get me wrong. And I was training with folks that, like, have played for the Saints. I used to train with Navarro Bowman. He used to um, be the linebacker for the 49ers. Now he's the coach for um, 
the Chargers. Mm-hmm. Uh, my guy, Toby, shout out to Toby. He's one of the trainers that trained me for the NFL tryouts. And like a lot of other opportunities that I had, uh, Rodney McLeod, who used to play for the Eagles. I don't know where he's playing at now. He was on the Browns last time I checked, but things that have changed. But it's like I have a consortium of people that I bumped into because I followed my passions and my passions to lead to those rooms. Mm-hmm. But like my friend Nisha was the reason this whole platform exists. She was the first person to actually believe in me. Oh. You feel what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, belief. It's important to keep track of those who really believed in you and acknowledge what they've given you because belief isn't just the act of, hey, you can do this. Sometimes belief is the act of even when things get hard, they're the loudest voice in the room and your voice just happens to not have it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. I've, I've gotten a lot of great things in life. That's why it's like, did I hate them? I had an issue with them. Mm-hmm. And, and, folks are trying to tell me otherwise and i was like i don't know who you guys are talking to but because i believe my greatness and i know how great of a person i am i used to tell folks you shouldn't tell the person who does a good job of believing in themselves what they should believe you should just right. let them figure it out yeah because it's like you know everyone has a villain there i just i just don't want to be a part of that <laughs> that's all yeah i was gonna ask if you were disappointed when you just get into the nfl oh heartbroken yeah heartbroken but I'm also very realistic. When I started training with other NFL players and I started working out with them, seeing where I was coming up short, seeing what technique wasn't really working well for me, seeing that my explosiveness was where it needed to be, I realized that I needed to revamp my body. And then by the time I got around to revamping my body, which had me working out with, I think Howard Battle, he was like ranked number 110 at the time in the U.S. in strongman competitions. That's what I was training with to get my body better. So I was doing things like running up hills. I was doing hand cleans in a pool. Do you know what a hand clean is? Yeah. Now imagine doing that in a pool. Oh, in a swimming pool. Yeah, for Ooh. water. Well, the water is above the way. And so that's how strong and explosive I became. But mm-hmm. I was becoming stronger while not being in the playoff speed because the Achilles was getting worse and worse. And I was deteriorating. So it's like. Yeah, you know, I've had like two birthdays that I slept in cars before tryout. Like slept in a car on my birthday to go do a tryout. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah, there's like there's like a lot of prices that I was willing to pay for my dream. And but then at the end of that, at the end of everything, I had a real calm to God move myself, and I was like, Hey man, you know your dream's supposed to love you back. Mm-hmm. And I tell folks that often, like you know, for all the things that you do that everybody praise you, that's great. Has that thing loved you back? And if not, you set the terms of your relationships with your dreams. If it doesn't love you back, why the hell are you still there? Yeah, okay. The NFL was my dream. It was no one else's dream. And I did everything I could to get there and everything I could to get in other leads to get to that opportunity. When I left, I left on my own terms. And I wasn't heartbreaking when I left. Yeah, I left on a scam, which was crazy. It was terrible. <laughs> terrible scam out of Baltimore. Shout out to my bad Shaq. He was looking for all the right resources and not his fault. Right? <laughs> But like that day that was my last trial was actually the last day of my relationship, my last relationship too, well, before everything hit the fan, because that person, they ran their course in their mind on what the relationship would be and who they thought I would be in the relationship. Mm-hmm. But it's like, you know, imagine you, you stop chasing your dream, right? The day you stop chasing your dream, the relationship that holds you up is over. But the reason the relationship is over is because that person stopped believing in you, but you didn't break up because they stopped believing in you. You broke up because you realized if what you're chasing and going after doesn't align with their goals, they're willing to become the person who eats away at whatever you're trying to do. Really? She was a bad person. I thought she was right. I thought... There were a lot of times that I said I wasn't going to try to do trials anymore and I led back to trials. But as I said before, your actions dictate who you want to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you notice that I was just I was just always who I was in the relationship. That doesn't change. Like I tell folks, look, when you want to change, there's 30 percent of you that you can change. And there's 70 percent. that Even if you're trying to change, your actions always going to dictate whether you really change or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best way to put it down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something came across my mind when you were describing like de- hang cleans in a swimming pool and tearing your Achilles up. Um, 
my body deserves better. Just like in everything, like food you eat, body deserves better. you told me that smoothie, that smoothie got you all the way? Me? No, you're not bullying. You're just, oh, it was yeah. like that, and that felt great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all the time. That's part of my wellness routine. Mm-hmm. How I know I'm unwell okay. is that I am going crazy on Uber Eats. It, is it? That's is that what you're measuring? I'm well, because well, one, one of my wellness measures is mm-hmm. like, you know, pre- preparing food for myself is an act of love. Mm-hmm. If I want someone else to do it for me out of love, then I need to be able to do it for myself. And so be intentional about what I put in my body. That is that is part of my wellness when I am getting greens and, you know, eating clean and having my smoothie in the morning. Like I feel energized. I feel happy. My body feels happy. I'm drinking my water. You know, when I'm eating Popeyes or like eating cheesesteaks, oh, no. it tastes so great in the Don't moment. It's amazing. Yeah, but then afterwards you're like, oh, wow, this yeah, doesn't feel good. Like yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Well, you mind if I make an observation? Sure. Do you go on Uber Eats when you've had a busy week? Yes. I go on Uber Eats when I'm stressed the out. Oh, <laughs> so I go on Uber Eats if I have a busy week and I realize I didn't plan out my week correctly. So if there's no food in the fridge, yeah, it you didn't plan it out correctly. Right, yeah. So you got to get groceries, but yeah. groceries are super expensive now. Yeah. So like. Uber Eats is like, hey man, I'll give you the buy one, get one free deal. That is, yeah, the buy one. But now I've yeah. had two cheesesteaks in a day and like, did I really need oh, that? No, that I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, but my diet yeah. has changed mm-hmm. from like drinking smoothies. Like I used to be able to eat like two and a half pizzas, like for fun if I wanted to. Mm. And I could only eat four slices and I'm good because okay. my stomach has gotten smaller from like drinking smoothies, right. drinking water a lot. Yeah. Um, even I'll have like four to five days out the week. I just do smoothies and meat. So smoothie and steak, mm-hmm. smoothie and chicken, not smoothie and bacon. That's kind of, you know, uh, yeah, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll have smoothie and a bacon egg and cheese yeah. sandwich. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But it's like it's paired with a smoothie. But like when when you think of food, do you mind if I give you advice like that I use for myself? Sure. Food is supposed to be about the quality of the taste. Mm-hmm. It's not supposed to be about filling yourself. Right. So, A, you have to learn to start being aware of when am I full and what does that look like? Recognizing when you're Mm -hmm. full. Because, like, when you haven't had much, when you finally get something or you finally have as much as as you can, it's very easy to be a glutton. And I I used to be a great glutton. I was so good at so perfect glutton, right? But then after that, when it comes to taste, just because someone's serving you pasta is the best pasta you had. Like the money that you're spending, are you really getting the value that you expect out of the food? Like my girl and I didn't order Mexican food in DC because we didn't really find really good Mexican spots for like a year and a half. And I was like, I don't know what happened, but spots that had Mexican food that was good, their food has some been good lately. And, then- and that means that you got to be aware of when your relationship is changing, you need some off stock gift. Yeah, that's, that's it. So yeah. it's like if you're gonna spend money, a I usually spend that Uber Eats money if we're busy and we didn't prep like we used to because I'm the one that does all the cooking, so she has chronic pains. And then, but B, it also comes down to if I order this food, is it mm-hmm. good right. or is it just well I'm full? Yeah, because if the answer is well I'm full, we shouldn't be ordering food from there again. Yeah, and that's the measure of stuff. I'd rather see five places that I order from that are consistent and good versus. 23 places that I remember being full, but I don't remember feeling that I ordered here. Yeah. So, side effects of living in the hood. Mm -hmm. I intentionally moved to that part of D.C. because I wanted to be where the patients were. Yeah. Um, And in my neighborhood, Uber Eats didn't deliver the good stuff. Yeah. Like, you're in a great place, Mm -hmm. but like, when I look at the list of Uber Eats, it's like, oh, the Chinese restaurant <laughs> with the high sodium or it's the Popeyes or it's Five Guys or yeah. it's like, you know, so the options aren't even that good. That I mean, if I was ordering Uber Eats and ordering Sweet Green, then I, I wouldn't feel like bad That's about crazy. it. But I'd spend a Sweet Green money. That, you know, no, I love Sweet Green. How much Sweet Green money you be spending? It's like $30. The prices are going out. The prices are kind of going out. 
I used to the bricks going up. Yeah. When I was at residency, I was across the street from Swiss mm-hmm. I went there every day. Okay. Yeah. Like, it was sweet. It was, it was sweet. sweet during the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now it's just green. It's just that's green. Yeah, that's all they're getting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um yeah, so I, I think the options are pretty limited for me mm-hmm. um in my neighborhood, which is also problematic. You know, this is part of what we're talking about, like the access to quality. Mm-hmm. Um, for but that's if you're raised there, that's quality that you're used to. Yeah, right? Yeah, you don't so, know anything different. Yeah. And then, like, once you do get to better, you not you may not realize that that better isn't actually all that good. It's just a vision. It's just better than what you got, not right. better than what you deserve. Yeah. And like you know, it's but it's like, oh, if it's better than what I got, mm-hmm. I don't blame folks that are like that. It's better than what I got. I'm like, ah, that's that's a great point. Yeah. Who am I to judge? Yeah. I'm the person that's living in the better. And ignorance is bliss, right? Yeah. Like you don't know. Ignorance you don't is know. fun. Ignorance is it. super fun. I'm what? Just what? When people tell me they what? want to know. It like <laughs> it destroy my little thing I was listening. <laughs> uh, please no, God. I just. But yeah. what's what's one piece of advice you'd say to someone looking to get into the work that you're doing right now? Um, be honest and genuine about the work that you're doing. Be in touch with why you're doing it, because that's what's going to keep you going. Like mm-hmm. you can't do it because you think somebody's going to thank you, or because you feel sorry for somebody. Like Joe. Yeah. You just have to have a real, like, genuine desire to see something different. Um, yeah. I don't know. Is that, was that good? I hear to mess your hands up, but that was very hard. That's the hard right? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. And in terms of your work and plans you have for next year. And then. What do you think is the most important focus for your work going forward now that you have this newer experience and a larger picture of what you're trying to do? The focus of the work is, I think I said it earlier, like healing, like, mm-hmm. you know, just trying to repair, like actually repair the wounds. I put a bandaid on it, but just like actually repair the wounds that will end the, the, the trauma cycle. You know, like, you know, learn through your children. That's that's going to be the the essence of everything that I do is like learning through children. And, and, you know, you want better for your kids. And so by being here with them, maybe you pick up something for yourself. So, Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. The going back to school haircuts that you're talking about and the braids for girls going back to school. Yeah. You should be or we should be the first organization that actually does the going back to summer also. Going back to summer. What is that? Haircuts for the summer. Oh, it's for the girls. Going they do that. Summer. Oh, do they? Who does? Do they do that? No, no they don't. No, do that. We, we should. Do it. Yeah, so we should. Yeah. And I was like, not yeah, adults sure. because it's like adults. I think that because a lot of adults are miserable, which is fine. We kind of had that conversation earlier. <laughs> There's this focus on oh, they're going to the summer, and now we got to figure out what to do. We got to make them busy, and it's like. Mm-hmm. You know, are we doing a good job of making them enjoy the time that they have off? Because yeah. what you're technically doing is you're training them to have to go to work. Mm-hmm. You're training them to, to well, you should be doing something with your time. But it's like, or should time be spent doing it how they're doing it now? We should just be adding that they have the opportunity to enjoy that time mm-hmm. that we no longer have. Because mm-hmm. we have things to do. Yeah, Like, it's okay to... Uh, manufacture leisure have them understand hey this time belongs to you use it wise mm-hmm. without the scare of your future is running on this yeah 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 the world's going in the wrong direction already let's just work yeah. what we have yeah yeah what do you think about teaching them the skills when we're going back to summer it's like okay we got a limited time you can sit up here and watch me braid and help me braid or help me do a haircut use the razor you know give them some type of um, skill and activity yes but now it feels like we're tying that into corporate thinking like you need to have a skill set that makes sense you can correct me if i'm wrong i mean i think it's a good idea what you're saying Mm -hmm. but it's like you know how do are we teaching kids how to have fun I think it would be fun when I when I talk to kids and I say like, mm-hmm. "What do you like to do?" I see the girls; they have their hair with mm-hmm. all these different designs, and like, 
the colors and whatnot. Like, I, I think it would be something that they would enjoy doing. When I think of what do you like to do, I think of are they going to the swimming pool? Are they going to skating rinks? No. Are they going to the movies? What's your favorite popcorn? What are you doing in your free time? Right, what's that TikTok that you really enjoy? You feel what I'm saying? Because it's like, yeah. cutting your braided hair. Yeah. I love it because I look good. But after that, all right, when you're done doing the structural thing, what are you going to do to unwind? And I mean, of course, there's such thing as too much unwinding. That's, that's yeah. risky. I've, I've been there before. Old yeah. dolls was like, hey, 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 stop that. <laughs> but yeah. you need to ship. Yeah. But, you know, we're adults. So yeah. you have to remember and learn how to be kids again, too. I mean, you're talking to somebody who went to hair school for fun. So like you went for fun. I didn't know you went for fun. I yeah. thought you were. I was going doing it. after work. Like uh-huh. it was. I have my job as a police officer. That was fun. I thought it's, you just had two hustles going. No, it's my pet. Pa- it's actually uh-huh. probably my passion. Like is it the fire that I was looking? You just for got called a was genius like, today. And now you are talking about <laughs> passions. I mean, you, yeah, you were. We were also talking about the um. What was it? The salon therapy idea. Right, yeah. yeah. It's like, that's part that's of your mind you bring into life that you gotta figure out how to do after you leave here, which would be super dope. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I sat down and put together a color formula for yeah. about hair today, like... Because yeah. you bought it. You because know, I'm... You cool. I loved hair, yeah, you know? That's it. And so... All right, Dr. Jones. so we won't force anybody to do haircuts or anything but we are inviting people or kids if they Mm -hmm. want if that's something they want to explore like they don't know what to it's cool yeah if you're the one pitching it they're not going to do it because you're dope Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying it always starts with you first like even when people come to our platforms which you're going to be on this platform okay yeah um Folks come because they want to hear our opinions or our perspectives, or they want to hear other people's opinions and perspectives. And a lot of people reach out because they want to know, hey, man, what the hell am I supposed to do with this thing that I have access to, but I don't really know who to give it to? Because I don't want to just give it to one family. I know there's other families that have this issue, and that's that's things that we run into on the daily. I had my friend that reached out to get hope for therapy. Okay. He said to the two folks, he said they were too expensive. I was like, well, how much do you got? He said, Forty dollars per session. I'm thinking twice a month. I was like, I don't know. This a pot and gets going hard to find. Yeah, but we're not giving up. Yeah, it's just understanding that's going to be hard to find. This house that we have right now, spot that we live in. This was we looked for three months, and I said, Hey, I didn't want us to spend three thousand dollars for a three bed, two bathroom spot. Got this for twenty six. What? You walk through that kitchen. You seen you seen the the inside when you came through. I was like, is that marble? I was like, that velvet. It's, this is nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like I'm still building out the studio, but like, there's an echo in here. You get what I'm saying? I've never had a room right. at any point in my life that was big enough to have an echo. There's an echo here, so now yeah. it's like, God, I need to use this correctly when I can. Yeah. But you know, with that being said, uh, hey, thanks to everybody that came out for this Mental Health Monday episode. You know, here with Dr. Jones, did a good job. Hopefully, you guys enjoy her. You're going to see a lot more of her. You know, thank you for coming through. Yeah, and you're welcome, of course. No, I appreciate you. And tell the people where you can find me. Well, they, where they can find you. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at raising underscore risers. Um, you can find me on email. My email address is jory, J O R I E J N S, at gmail.com. Okay. That's it. Oh, YouTube, raising risers. Is that YouTube? And the- that's on that space. Follow me. Okay. Yeah. I close. Yeah. I don't know if you follow if you sent it or not, but now I'm like, oh, I got follow the YouTube. Yes. Yeah. That's dope. How long have you got the YouTube for? Um, like since April. Okay. okay. Yeah. Is it nice over there? Like nice to you? Okay. YouTube could be kind of mean to people. I only have two. I, I don't have any comments or followers. Oh, I don't know. We don't have school bound thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, 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 no, they're cool. That's not. 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 That